Good morning, uh, saints of God. How are you? Sunday morning, it's nine o'clock mountain time. Coming to you live from uh, Phoenix. Actually, I'm in Sun, Sun City, technically. Welcome to Arizona. This is a uh, broad podcast number 11 on uh, hardcorechristianity.com. I'm Brother Mike. Welcome to the program. I wanted to talk to something, a couple of things that are very interesting today to help you if you're physically ill, believe it or not, sometimes you have to be healed internally in order to be healed externally. I want to talk to you a little bit today about how that works. Um, if you go to our website, hardcorechristianity.com, you'll see all of our ministry services available. You notice we have uh, free seminars all the time, practically. We have uh, deliverance services for children. And we have uh, two live services every week. Um, two of them are on, uh, on the internet, our Zoom healing services. We have two of those every week, Tuesdays and Wednesday night at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. You send me an email, mike at hardcorechristianity.com. I will send you the uh, the uh, ID and the uh, passcode. And we also have two live services every week, Thursdays and Friday nights at the Deliverance Center. We're downtown on 15th Avenue, just south of Osborne Road. It's the Red Brick Building. And that's at 7 p.m. Mountain Time. It's also broadcast live on uh, several of our platforms. Our main platform is youtube.com slash House of Healing AZ. Good morning to everybody. Thanks for tuning in. I want to share, share with you a little bit about uh, inner healing um, today. There was a beautiful example of it in the, in the New Testament. It was fantastic. It's in Matthew chapter 9. This uh, event, as you know, is recorded you know, I think three times in the Gospels. The Synoptic Gospels all have this story. But um, it says Jesus entered into a ship and came over uh, to uh, his own city. His own city meaning Capernaum. That was his headquarters. That's where he, he technically lived. And behold, they brought to him uh, a man that was sick of the pal palsy. Now, that Greek word there for palsy is paralyticus. It's someone that has a spinal cord injury. And it says he was lying on a bed. Uh, kline, a kline is a, uh, Greek, the Greek word for some kind of a, a couch or a cot. Uh, and so, and we know from the other two stories about this event that uh, this young boy uh, was paralyzed and he had been brought there by four of his relatives or his friends. Four people that cared about this guy brought him to Jesus's service. And of course the place was packed because Jesus had been traveling and now he was back home where his headquarters were and he drew massive crowds at Capernaum, as he did everywhere. And uh, they brought this boy on a cot, probably a handmade gurney, and they couldn't get to him. They couldn't, they couldn't get the boy into the facility that he was at because there was too many people there. And so... As you know, back in the day, people had uh, porches on their homes, but they didn't have porches like we have them today where they're out front on the ground where you sit out on your porch, look at your yard or something. They didn't have that then. They had them, usually had them on their roofs. And so everybody had access to a roof. And so if this was Jesus's house, he would have had a porch on his roof. And then you wouldn't 
he went in the back to climb up the stairs, the steps to get to the roof. And people frequently went out on the roof at night because it was hot during the summer and they would uh, cool down or after they took a bath, they would sit up at night to relax, stare at the stars, what have you. The same, the same, same reason we have them for today. And they cart this guy up these steps, four guys. And when they get up to the roof, they start to remove the tiling. And you can imagine the mess this made while they're tearing the roof up to get this kid down to see Jesus. And this story is uh, remarkable in that it teaches so many vital truths for Christians today because 90% of Christians that are sick cannot get healed. Most people that are physically sick also have soul wounds and they need inner healing in addition to physical healing. And they can't get either. And so they lower this guy using their tunics. They lower him down through the roof on all four corners of the cot. And he comes down through the roof right in front of Jesus. The people are amazed. It's a mess. There's stuff falling from the ceiling. It's dusty. It's dirty. Everybody's just watching this guy come down out of the ceiling. It's quite remarkable. And the Bible says that Jesus saw their faith, it says. Here's verse 2. Behold, they brought him a man with paraluticus lying on a cot. And Jesus, seeing their faith, seeing their faith. Now, this is the Greek word pistos for faith here. It does not mean what we think faith means in English. In English, faith, F-A-I-T-H, means to be persuaded that something is factual or true. Pistos doesn't mean that. Pistos is God faith. Pistis means that you believe something and you have no doubts about it and you have no unbelief. Pistis is pure faith in English. That term can be mixed with doubt or unbelief. As you know, if somebody tells you they're going to be at your house at seven o'clock for dinner, well, you have faith that they're going to show up, but you don't have pistis they're going to show up because if there's a possibility they won't show up. They could get in a car accident. They could forget. You know, different things could happen. Emergency could pop up. They couldn't. They don't show up. So you have faith they're going to show up, but you don't have pistis they will. But pistis, faith, God faith, doesn't allow for doubting. It doesn't allow for granules of unbelief. So when Jesus saw their faith, pistis, he turns to the sick of the palsy and he says to him, son, be of good cheer. Now, that was mistranslated in the King James Bible. Bible. The Greek word is technon. Technon is, uh, would be someone like a kid, uh, a, young, a young adult, like junior high. You know, 14, 15, 13, something like that. It should have been trans, translated uh, youngster, be of good cheer. Your sins are forgiven you. Now here you see more divine revelations. It says in the King James Bible, be of good cheer. That wasn't translated very well either. 
uh, tharseo is the Greek word. It means uh, to have courage, to be courageous. So what had happened here was something had happened, probably the fault of the boy. This boy had been doing something, going somewhere, playing somewhere, what have you. And he had an accident and he broke his neck and he was paralyzed. And he has chronic emotional pain that his life had been taken from him. Now his parents had to take care of him. They had to feed him. They had to take him to the bathroom and wipe his fanny and clean up his urine. He had to be taken care of 24 seven. And he felt very guilty, very guilty over what had happened. He was very hurt over it. And he had developed uh, kind of some shame and guilt and self-hatred over it. He thought about it all the time, the accident, and blamed himself. And was living in total misery 24-7. And Jesus says to him, be, cur be courageous, have courage. Your sins are forgiven. Now that Greek word forgiven there is very important. You need to understand how this system works. It's the Greek word aphiomi. It means to release. See, when you become a born-again Christian and you receive Christ and you repent of your sins and you have the born-again experience, John chapter 3, that's a supernatural experience that's miraculous. And when that happens, God forgives you or releases you from your sins. Your sins literally leave you and you become sinless. Your spirit man is literally sinless. So now you can come boldly to the throne of grace and obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Why? Because your spirit man is sinless and you have been transitioned into the kingdom of God. You have gone from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light and now you are, you are a born again Christian with the Holy Ghost and you can just come into your heavenly father Anytime you need him, because you've been released of your sins. Your sins have been released from you, they're gone. And Jesus said, Be courageous, your sins are released from you. And you see here, Jesus is not focusing on his physical illness. First, he's focusing on his inner healing, inner healing many times must come before physical healing. Your inner healing must come first. I've seen hundreds of people healed over the years using this process. When I focused on the inner healing first and I saw God release them from their sins, he releases them from you. The physical healing naturally followed. It just popped in. <laughs> it automatically comes in. Boom, you're there. You're healed. I've seen that happen numerous times over the years. And sitting around Jesus were stalkers, um, bad, the bad kind, people that are nitpickers, critical types. 
And listen, when you develop your Holy Ghost ministry and you start to move in the spirit and you start to see people get better. This happened to me years ago. Sinners are not going to turn on you. Sinners will actually come for help. The people that turn on you the most are religious people. People at the church. They will not like you. They will be jealous of you. And they will start nitpicking you, criticizing you, finding fault with you, fault finders. And Jesus had all kinds of religious people stalking him. And they were fault finders. You know, they were looking for a reason he was not the Messiah. They were trying to find a reason to justify in their minds. That's what the devil does to you all the time. He tries to give people reasons that you can't be legit. I was teaching at the Deliverance Center one night, and I was telling a story about something. I can't even remember what I was illustrating. I was trying to illustrate some spiritual point, and I used the phrase, oh, my God. I said, oh, my God, this and that. The person said, oh, my God, this, then that, and then this. And uh, the story was kind of funny and people were giggling. And then I went on to, you know, continue to illustrate what I was trying to share. And I got emails on that the next day. One, a gal sent me an email and said that, that I was a terrible sin and that I was blaspheming God and taking the Lord's name in vain and that I was, I was a heaving sinner and so on. She went on and on about it. And I knew that 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 was those were religious demons, scribe demons. And that's what happened to Jesus here. Same thing. There are people that follow you that are looking for their their bias to be fulfilled in you. They believe that you're a farce, that you're not real. <coughs> Excuse me. And they're looking for something to criticize you over. So they said to in themselves, in their minds, they were saying, this man is a blasphemer. Yahshua is a, is a blasphemer. We've got him. He's not of God. Now we've got our answer. We can go back to the Pharisees and tell everybody, this guy is a farce. He's a liar. He's a fraud. We can get rid of him. And the Bible says in verse 4, Jesus, knowing their thoughts. Now, that's interesting. Um, Jesus could, idu, the Greek word is, idu. He saw their thoughts. He saw, saw them. Some people have the gift of knowledge. And the gift of knowledge operates at such a level that they can actually see or hear someone else's thoughts. They can see or hear conversations. And in this case, Jesus is, could see their thoughts and he said to them, why do you think evil in your hearts? The Greek word for evil there is paneros. Honorous means uh, perverted. Why are you thinking perverted thoughts in your hearts? What is easier to say? Sins be released? Your sins be released from you? Or if I say arise? Walk. And they're just staring at him. See, back in those days, people thought that it was easier to get healed than it was forgiven. In our system now, today, we think it's easier to get forgiven than it is to get healed. Now, 99.9% .9 of all churches only preach salvation. When in fact the gospel covers deliverance and healing, 
routinely, like it does salvation. They were all part of God's system of the gospel. The Greek word for gospel is euangelion. It means good news. And Jesus says, so you may know that I have the ability to release people from their sins. He turns to the boy, the child on the cot, and he says, the Greek word iro, take up. Iro means to pick up and get rid of. Pick it up and take it out. <coughs> Excuse me. And he said, pick up your cot and go, go to your house. Oikos is the Greek word for house there. It means your home. Go back home where you live. Now, you can only imagine the celebration that went on in that house that day. Verse 7, he arose and he went home. And when the multitudes of people saw it, they were utterly amazed. It says they marveled. The Greek word is thamazo. They were in a state of shock. They were absolutely stunned. And they glorified God that had given such power to men. The Greek word for power there is not dunamis, supernatural power. It's exousia, authority. God had given God the Father, had given God the Son authority to release people from their sins. He has the authority to release you from your sins. And so the devil, of course, focuses on the exact opposite. Whatever uh, Christ's authority is, he focuses on the opposite. When you came to Christ and you were sincere and you were born again and you repented of your sins and you turned your life over to the Lord, you were released from your sins, which means that you are sinless. <laughs> you are sinless. You are sinless. You don't have any sin. Now you've been released of it. That's the kind of authority that Jesus has. And that's the kind of power there is in the blood. The power of the blood. You don't have any sin anymore because you've been released of it. It's all gone. See? So, you're struggling right now because of inner healing and your physical healing won't go away. Hey. It's fixable. Why don't you just choose to believe this beautiful story in Matthew chapter 9? It's a fabulous story. And it works fantastic with people who have regrets. People who live with regrets. Regrets are extremely painful to live with. Because the spirits keep bringing it back to your memory. Oop, there it is. Remember when you made that decision? How about this one? Screwed that up. Oh, God, you married him. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, my gosh. You married her? Oh, no. You quit that job? Wow. You didn't invest in that? Oh, no. My dad didn't get saved till he was in his 50s. And uh, when he was young, 
He went to bars all the time, picking up chicks. He was funny. He had a great sense of humor, a good-looking guy. He sat in a bar one night in uh, Toledo, Ohio, and there's a guy at the bar, and he's drunk. He sits down beside him, and the guy was miserable. And my dad started talking to him, and the guy tells him a story about how he and a friend of his had a chance to invest in a company called Fisher Body, which uh, later on was picked up by General Motors. And uh, they were going to give him a piece of the com company. And he needed two grand. And the guy d decided not to do it. He invested somewhere else. And well, you know the rest of that story. <coughs> he would have been a billionaire or something like it today. But instead he became a bleary-eyed stumble bum of a drunk. And that's how he ended his life. But my dad, uh, unfortunately, never actually learned from that experience. But when you have regrets, the devil keeps running them through your mind constantly. And uh, it drives you crazy. It, it just exhausts you. And if you keep listening to those regrets... If you keep listening, it's going to block your healing, your destiny, your gifts, your giftings. Everything's going to be blocked. It's going to be just awful. But when you come to Christ and you ask for forgiveness, you're set free. You never did it. The regrets are gone. Old things are passed away. <coughs> and all things become new. Old things pass away. All things become new. And you start over. You know, the Bible says God's mercies are new every morning. His compassion is they fail not. Wow. What's he trying to tell you? Sometimes inner healing has to come before physical healing. Because many people feel hurt by their regrets and their failures and they don't feel worthy to be healed physically. They don't feel worthy to be healed. And they made a cocoon around themselves of excuses. Well, this is my cross to bear. I'm supposed to be bearing this. Uh, I deserve this. Uh, this. This should have happened to me. Here's why. I've gotten these benefits out of my sickness. And so this cocoon of excuses envelops the person. And they don't have any faith anymore. Je the story said Jesus saw their faith. He saw it. <coughs> he saw their faith. Yeah, you can't see something that you don't have. Listen, the truth of the matter is you have been released of your sins. And Jesus said, freely you have received, so freely give. If you've been released of your sins by God, then you must release others of their sins 
to you. And if you don't, it's going to block your physical healing and your inner healing. You're going to stay sick. You have to release your ex-husband, your ex-wife. You have to release your kids. They stabbed you right square in the back. They used you. They took your money, your time, your love, your energy. Yep. And you have to release them today because God released you of your sins. And if, if you don't do it, ow, ouch. You're going to stay sick for the rest of your life. And we can't afford that because your destiny is out before you. You have to fulfill your destiny. You have to overcome any kind of adversity that you face. It doesn't matter what it is. You've got to overcome it. You've got to face it. You've got to keep going. You cannot quit. You cannot give up. You know, like Jimmy V said, never quit, never give up. Well, this is a spiritual battle. This is much more important than what Jimmy V was talking about, cancer. And in order to do that, you have to release others of their sins. Remember when Jesus said, whoever sins you release, they're released to them. Whoever sins you forgive, they are forgiven to them. Whosoever sins you retain are retained unto them. <coughs> Excuse me. Well, now that verse makes sense. Yeah, you can be sinned or abused by others. Boom, you can be hit. It's happened to 100% of all of us. All of us have been screwed over and betrayed. But I can release them of their sins toward me. Aphiomi is the Greek word. But if I retain those sins that they did to me, I have to say sick. I have to die ill, and that's not an option. We can't do that. If an abuser or someone who betrays you causes you a soul wound and damages you, then they win. They won. The devil ultimately wins. He wins. Because he was behind the abuse. He told them to hurt you. He told them to damage you. It's that simple. And if you don't release it, then they win. They win. And that's not an option now, not, not with your life. Now you made a mistake like this kid did and he was paralyzed. He screwed up. They were probably goofing off, climbing trees, climbing on fences, what have you. I don't know what he was doing. Does, we don't have the details. <clears throat> but we do know that he was very hurt and that Jesus dismissed temporarily the obvious reason they brought him, which was he was paralyzed. They lowered him down through the roof for crying out loud. That's what he needed. That's what they thought he needed. But Jesus saw through that and saw he needed something else that was more important. 
See, spiritual and emotional healing many times is far more important than the physical healing. Because many people get physically healed and they don't improve that much phys spiritually. I've actually seen that happen. I've seen people healed that uh, never finished their deliverance and got reinfected with demons later. Or I've seen people lose their healings, believe it or not. Yeah, they've they lost their healings. Not because the power of God to heal is weak, but because they're weak. They wouldn't release whatever it was. Taking offenses, ought, anger toward others. I've seen all this stuff happen, folks. I've been a counselor for 40 years. I got like an encyclopedia of experiences in my head. That's not a good place to have them. I wish I had them on an off drive, but you're going to release everything is what you're going to do because God released you and freely you have received freely gift. Yeah. 100% of us have stuff that we would go back and do totally differently. 100% of us. Okay. There's no doubt about it. Okay. Right? Yeah. Man, I tell you what, I could I could give you a list of stuff off the top of my head that I would have done differently and that I failed at that I would have fixed. Wow. I can't even believe how many of them there are. Unbelievable number of mistakes. Regrets. You go, hey. When you failed in the past, when you came to Christ and you were forgiven, you didn't fail. Remember when you used to be an adulterer or an adulteress? You used to sleep around. You were kind of a whoring around, slutting around. Remember that? <coughs> you remember that? Yeah. No, you didn't. Not anymore. You never committed adultery. You never did that. That sin never existed. No, remember those failures? All the times you screwed up, ruined the marriage, you ruined the business. Remember that? No, good, because this never happened. When God forgives, he forgets. And that's really what you what you really want. You'd like a, a new start. You'd like somebody to erase the chalkboard and move forward. That's what you really want. Well, good news. Matthew chapter 9, your prayers are answered. God erase this kid's chalkboard. Be, a, be courageous, son. Have courage. Believe this. Because it's going to take courage to believe God when other people around you are constantly criticizing you and nitpicking you. Imagine that. Yeah, it's tough. It's, it's hard to believe God when you're a, you know, a unit of one. No, that's not easy. This kid's laying on the cot there. He can't move a muscle. He's totally disabled. His parents got to take him to the bathroom. He can't even feed himself anymore. He's so depressed you can't believe it. It's severe clinical depression. And Jesus says, have courage. I'm releasing you from your sins. And the critical people went berserk. They freaked right on the spot. What? Oh, man, they were on him like a dog on table scraps. All over Jesus. In their minds. Some people look at you, nod and smile, but they actually hate your guts. That's very common. Jesus saw them looking at him and nodding and then heard them. He saw their thoughts. <coughs> he saw their thoughts. You're a blasphemer. This guy's a fraud. 
Yahshua was a fraud. He's a liar and a fraud. We got to get rid of him. We got the proof now. That's what the devil does. He's the accuser of the brethren. He's always looking for a chance to nitpick you and criticize you. It happens all the time. It's day and night. Yeah, you're not focused on that anymore because you don't have those problems anymore. You did those failures have been wiped out by the blood. Those sins were wiped out by the blood. And today you're going to take courage. Have courage, Jesus said to the boy. Your sins have been released from you. Your sins are released from you. They're, they're gone. They're, they're gone. You, you weren't divorced 10 times. You didn't have four business failures. You didn't lose all your family's money. It never happened. It's gone. Yeah. I know everybody around you kind of looks at you like, oh, you're, you're a bag. Of, you're a useless bag of losing. You're a loser. Okay, well, that's what they think, but God released you from that. And so right now, the only important thing is what Father thinks of you. The only thing that mattered was what Jesus thought of that kid on the cot. It didn't matter what anybody else thought. They thought he was a blasphemer. That didn't even phase him. He didn't, he didn't proceed. Oops, I better not. Better not forgive this kid of his sins or release him from him because they're going to think I'm a blasphemer. Oh, I don't want people to think bad of me. No, he did the exact opposite. He did what was right. He did what was right. And what unbelievable reunion in that family. I mean, the guys on the roof saw that miracle. And they were off that roof faster than African chimps. They were screaming and yelling out in front of his house like you would not even believe. They ran home to the rest of his family to bring that kid. They were carrying his cot over their head like that, you know. It was a day of miracles. But his inner healing occurred first. And many times in your ministry, you're going to realize that you're going to have to minister to someone's soul before you minister to their body. And many times in your ministry, you'll realize that once you minister to your soul, in many cases, not all, in many cases, the body is automatically healed. You don't even have to do anything. When I was a teenager and I wasn't serving God, um, I was in a Catherine Kuhlman service in Tulsa, Oklahoma. This is back in the 70s. And uh, that's a long story. And I made a video of it on my YouTube channel. Brother Mike meets Catherine Kuhlman. I, tell, I give the testimony of that day when I was a teenager that I went to that service in Tulsa. But in that service that day, uh, much to my utter amazement, I saw some severely disabled people healed. And one case in particular uh, has never left me to this day. I was sitting on the aisle on the lower level down near the front. I was about, you know, 20, 25 rows deep on the ground level. And I was sitting on the aisle. And behind my seat, way in the back, was uh, one of the wheelchair sections. Well, at the end of the service, when Catherine... Uh, started to pray, there was a bunch of commotion and noise and clanging and gasping and crying and screaming in the whole auditorium. It was uh, it was uh, utterly amazing. I've never seen anything like it. 
<coughs> the uh, facility got really quiet. You could almost hear a pin drop while she was praying. And uh, the clanging and noises and the moans and the crying started all over the auditorium. There were 16,000 people there, no seats left. All the seats were taken. And behind me on my right, I was sitting on the aisle. Something was going on behind me. And so I, I kind of turned like this to look back there. And some guy was walking down the aisle that looked like an Auschwitz victim in the Holocaust. This guy was paper thin. He had pipe cleaners for arms. He had pencils for legs. He had bones for face, his face. And he was walking, you know, gingerly, kind of altered gait, bouncing back and forth, not almost like he was just learning to walk. And I realized that this was one of the quadriplegics from the wheelchair section. <coughs> they had gotten healed. And I looked at this guy's face, and I'll never forget as long as I live, there were tears streaming down his eyes. And he was crying all the way from the back, all the way down to the front, and he was walking by himself. And you could tell that he had been in a wheelchair for, you know, decades. His body was, had complete atrophy. And I can only imagine uh, the depression and the sadness that this guy had developed over the years of being a quadriplegic. That's got to be the worst of all disabilities, worse than being blind. And this guy walked right past me. And I just stared at him like I was, you know, seeing a ghost walk right past me down to the front. I could not believe it. But the point of that short story was she never prayed personally for anybody. She didn't go around like laying hands on people like I do at the deliverance center. You know, none of that, nothing like that occurred. She was just standing up there, you know, very strange looking woman. Uh, very strange sounding woman, very um, odd duck, to say the least. She was an odd duck. She was just uh, saying uh, strange things, uh, prayers, strange prayers, and uh, never touched anybody, didn't pray specifically that anybody be healed or anything like that. And this guy's walking right past me. Literally, I was... I might have been a foot from him when he walked by me, maybe a foot and a half, maybe. And uh, he looked like death warmed over. <coughs> this guy was so sick, it was unbelievable. Excuse me. Just getting over COVID again. This guy was so sick, it was unbelievable. So sick, it was unreal. It had been for decades. You could tell he had been in a wheelchair for years. And that image never left me as long as I'm alive. I'm, I'm pushing 70 now, and I can remember that like I was there. I saw that guy walk past me. It was unreal. It made a lasting impression, to say the least. But the point simply is that uh, you can be released of your failures and your regrets which are kind of the root cause of a lot of clinical depression cases, long-term regrets, long-term sadness, long-term failure. Wasted years is a huge uh, regret button for Satan. He just routinely causes people to live in regret because they wasted so many years in this marriage, at that job, they wasted all this time on this person. 
time wasting is one of Satan's most powerful tools to get you to waste your years because we all have very few years to waste. There's, there's, there's no time. Um, before you know it, you're old. Yeah, you wouldn't even believe. It. I mean, I can remember when I was in grade school, right to the second, I can remember running around grade school. Yeah, that was decades ago. I mean, the years go by so fast, it's unreal. And the devil knows that. He knows how quick time goes. Because he's heading toward the lake of fire, and he's getting closer and closer. And he's panicking more and more as the end draws near for him. He knows his time is short. And he's freaking. And that's why he's attacking you so viciously. Because he doesn't want you to release your wasted years to God. So he can restore them. Only the Holy Ghost can restore lost years. He's the only person with that kind of skill. Nobody else has it. And God will do it. But you got to repent of your regrets. You have to forgive yourself for all the mistakes you've made. Woulda, coulda, and shoulda has got to go. Be courageous, son. Your sins have been released from you. Wow. Be courageous, saints. Your sins have been released from you. You don't have them anymore. Your failures, your losses, they have been released from you. If you won't release them, then God can't restore them. Okay? This kid on the cot, when Jesus said that to him, I know what was happening. I can see it in my mind's eye. He started to cry like you wouldn't believe. He started to weep in front of everybody. He didn't care. He was crying like you wouldn't believe. Because Jesus ministered right into that spot right there in his soul. There it is. He went right to the spot. That's how the Holy Ghost does it. He goes right to the spot. And he's so good at it. So good at it. Wow, it's amazing. And you know, when you come to God later in life, like I did, I didn't come to God until I was in my 40s. I'd already blown over half my life, you know, or half of it anyway. You got a lot more regrets than somebody who gets saved as a teenager because the longer you live, the longer chance you have to screw yourself up. So I had a lot of screw ups. A lot of sin, a lot of mistakes, a lot of failures. On the surface of it, when I got saved, on the surface, oh, I looked, yeah, I looked great, you know. Um, I was a millionaire. I had my own business. I lived the American dream. I came from white trash to money. I was a successful person, no problem. But... The truth of the matter is, no, I was miserable. I was living in sin. I was paying the price of serving Satan. Yeah, it was not a pretty sight. And I had a lifetime of regrets and mistakes. I sure did. But what I found out was God could release them from me. Not only my failures and my regrets, but my mistakes, my trespasses. That's the Greek word, paroptima. It means your failings, your screw-ups. He not only forgives your sins, he also forgives your trespasses, your screw-ups. I know this is going to sound weird, but you are no longer a screw-up. You're no longer a mistake. You were when you were conceived. Yes, that's true. Okay, your parents didn't want you. 
Okay, I'm with you. I was a out of wedlock baby myself. Okay. Yeah, you you were you were an oops, but you are not an oops to God. First Corinthians chapter one. Specifically says it. Ephesians chapter one specifically says it. When you were conceived, this is an egg. That's a sperm. That's you. At that moment of conception, God said, I want you. I want that one. Go get me that one. That would be you, friend. <laughs> yeah. uh, he wants you. Be courageous. Your sins have been released from you. Matthew chapter 9. If you have any questions or concerns or suggestions, please send me an email. Mike at hardcorechristianity.com. Okay, I've been out this week. I got COVID again. This is the second time I've gotten it. I got, the, I got a little milder version than the first one I got. The first one was weird. This one's weird, too. This uh, my man-made Chinese virus thing is getting to be a drag. But I'll be back soon. And uh, if you have any questions, send me an email. If you have any um, need for prayer or healing, please be on the two Zoom services every week, Tuesdays and Wednesday night. Please be on our YouTube services Thursday and Friday night and uh, stay for the deliverance and healing portion of that service and you can get healed along with everybody else. You can get delivered along with everybody else. Be courageous. Your sins have been released from you. You're a winner now. <laughs>